both live. Crowd of three. And, <laughs> on, <laughs> uh, on the live stream, if anyone's watching. Um, this is my little, oh, there's a pop up. I'm not sure what it means. Oh. Very stressful, very scary. You might ask no, me. it's fine. It, it's still Fantastic. live. This is live yeah, stream it's, it it's okay. <laughs> um, it's really cool artwork. I worked really hard on this five slide presentation about replies, but I think it packs a lot of content That's in. One more slide per minute. <laughs> exactly. Um, the best replies will, and this is my favorite page. Hi guys, you haven't missed a lot. I just said my name and I said replies are really important, so we are all aware of that. Um, so. I think the best replies are really desperate replies because you are literally fighting for your life. Um, and I think that shows in most of the replies you get good speak spot. Um, I think like the cliche is that a reply is like a biased adjudication. If you give a biased adjudication, you're probably giving a good reply. But I think if you wanna give a great reply um, and what replies actually should look like is kind of evaluating the pathways that both teams could take in order to win a debate. Um, and obviously the most important thing is like considering what your opposition has to prove in order to win all of the turning points and linchpins in their case that have to go the exact way they need them to, to for them to convince the judge and then explaining to the judge all the ways that down your line you've convinced them that that's not possible by the end of the debate. Um, and once you've done that and you've explained why their pathway is impossible, then you look at what you have to prove to now tip the balance in your favor, explaining why all of the are not sufficient and then you can kind of whip out some you know additional stuff you do to extend the margin run the victory laps all that fun stuff um, I think the most important thing though is that replies more than anything kind of consider the meta strategy for both teams uh, and if you only focus on your team or you only focus on responding to the other team you leave yourself vulnerable to either the other team coming up and attacking you or your own reply speech being outweighed so I think that kind of uh, 
looking at their pathways and looking at your pathways is the best way to structure this. Um, and obviously like the crux of all of this is just kind of identifying what those turning points in both cases are and proving the analysis for both teams, packaging the arguments that your speakers have already come up with uh, to the judge. And that's things like looking at the responses that have come up to both arguments, the like sophistication of mechanisms and how realistic they are and like all the weighing that your speakers have already done. Um, I think like a easy way if you're a beginner replies is like when I first started speaking as a first speaker in 2019, my replies were like very basically structured. I just went through best case versus like worst case for both teams. Um, and I still do this like within analysis because I think it's a really good way of explaining why margins are wider than the judge might think they are. Um, so the worst case, and this is kind of another way of packaging that pathway stuff is like, if everything that could possibly go wrong for your case in the debate went wrong, how do you still win? And that's that like desperation stuff. I think it really sells judges. You're like, even if you ignore all of the brilliant content that me and my two best friends have brought up, why can we still win? And I think like the best way to kind of get around that is doing things like weighing and kind of framing what the realistic characterization of the debate is. And if you're able to show your judge that you win in the worst case, then you can win the debate by a really big margin because then you get up and say the best case and actually it's not the best case it's the realistic case that's a good line um, shows why the margin is really wide and that shows well based on the analysis that we've given you in the debate the way that clashes have blown out this is what the world actually looks like so if you believe that we win in the worst case great news give us a debate by like 10 points um, and so that's why it's really important to be comparative and i think if you're starting out like you can use the same points of clash structure that your third speaker might do, but I think that best case, worst case kind of comparison is a good way of framing some of those arguments. Um, and then obviously, yeah, like be comparative. You're always showing why your case is more important than the other teams. They're kind of similar to a third speaker, but I think you don't have to get bogged down in the weeds of responses as much because you're able to just kind of take a big picture, look at like if you had four minutes to tell the judge the story of your case, what would it look like? Awesome. Any questions on that? Sorry, there are like very few slides, but I do I do have things to say. Packaging material, Asia. My question was going to be, how do you delegate time? Is it just a two minute, two minute split, or do you have to think a little bit more about that? I am the wrong person <laughs> to ask about delegating uh, time. Four minute, 30 replies are my special, and it means that my beautiful, flourishy outros do not get um, any any weight in in my reply scores which is so sad um i think like kind of my starting point is always like i am desperate to win debates so i focus on like all of the ways that i could lose the debate and spend my time explaining why the judge like would be so dumb if they believed any of those to be true and then i leave myself like maybe a minute at the end to victory lap and be like as well as all of this, here is what my third speaker has already explained and one which shows why we win the debate by a lot. Um, obviously, this is dependent on kind of like how the debate has played out so far. So like if you've been outclassing every speaker, you probably can just afford to say like, you know, at each point we have disproven these mechanisms is why we win by a lot. Um, but if there is, for example, one really specific pathway that maybe you haven't been able to close in responses, you might focus a lot of time in your reply on explaining why the weighting of that point means that it's unimportant and you can still win on your other material. So that's kind of like my packaging material stuff. Um, so obviously in your three substantive speeches, speakers kind of go into the nitty gritty of the debate in different ways. Like the first presents the mechanisms, the second does a lot of responses, third does like kind of important weighing on individual clashes. Um, I think replies are like the beautiful landscape image and like you just kind of zoom out and you're like, all of these little points, here's how they coalesce into like a winning case. Um, so the kind of important things you're doing is that you're linking materials. So things like, you know, for example, the mechanisms that your first brings up and like the context that your second might provide, the impacting that you have throughout the case and you're explaining how all of those flow logically, especially if that hasn't been done within the case itself. Um, and that's kind of how you get around that, having new contributions without bringing up new material because all you're doing is you're explaining how the dots already line up in the case. 
Um, and I think the important thing is you want to make sure that you're appealing to a judge's intuition because obviously like if your arguments are undercooked so far the judge will know that they are and like no amount of being like we mechanize this really well <laughs> um, won't gaslight the judge you want to gaslight carefully <laughs> um, and the best reply will make the judge doubt themselves so I think you want to be able to suggest that where you got so far in how much of your mechs you proved the logical extension would be that X impact happens and you want to explain why as like an average reasonable voter who has seen the debate that has played out why would you think that this would be the outcome based on the mix you've already given and obviously the scale of impact that you're able to claim relies somewhat on the you know ways that you proved your mix the ways that they are weighed within the debate but your job as a reply speaker is to kind of explain why given what we've already proven why are we able to claim the largest extent of impacting um, so I think that's kind of the biggest thing about just like appealing to a judge's intuition you're kind of like not bringing up new responses you can say new things so long as it logically links to what has already been said and doesn't sound like a total departure from the case then in terms of how you use responses in a reply um, so obviously like you know blanket rule is don't have new responses but if you are at reply and your neg block is like really sneaky, but you are smart and you pick up on the sneaky stuff, isolate the new material, but don't just say this is new so I'm responding to it. You kind of have to like cleverly explain to your judge why it is so new that they can't credit it to existing arguments because obviously the blanket kind of uh, allowance we give to the third neg reply speakers third neg speakers <laughs> is that they can bring up new substantive contributions so long as it links very clearly to what has already come up in their case so your job is to identify what they do when they're being really clever and say hold on this actually isn't linked directly if you look at what the first and second speaker said the conclusion of their point and the mechanisms they bring you would be that this is the scale of impact they get what the third speaker does is they add a whole layer of analysis on and you can respond to that because it's new, right? If you can show that the scale of impacting would have been different if that analysis wasn't there and why it's not closely linked to what has already come up. So isolate the material and respond to it, but make sure you are explaining to the judge when you're doing that, because obviously like you will, you know, get penalized a bit because judges are sometimes lazy about judging replies. So you want to be walking them through the process. Um, and basically just like be smart, right? Like if obviously your team has forgotten to respond to a point, responding to it at, at reply is not going to be a good strategy, but what you can do is use the material that you've already brought up and explain why that's so important that those responses don't matter. Kind of lean into the meta of it instead of relying on responses. Um, don't be assertive, glib, or cringe. I really hate buzzwords in replies because they're a waste of time and I know it's so bad to waste time. I'm always running out of time in my reply speeches. So don't just call things symmetric unless you're able to demonstrate why the impact of that mechanism is symmetric. Um, don't just call things a wash unless you've done the work to explain why the impacting is so low that it becomes washed in the debate. Um, and that's just because you're always gonna get significantly further in your reply if you're able to actually link to stuff you've already done than to just kind of like desperately say they were so assertive and like our mechs were so strong and the judge will just be like where <laughs> where so make sure you're always linking back to material use buzzwords strategically in the best case don't use buzzwords just be smart and use really good arguments which is kind of what you know the thrust of debating is um playing to the crowd i think like the best replies kind of have a vibe you know like maybe you're a really funny speaker and that's kind of how you deliver replies you like make fun of your opposition maybe you get really passionate and that's your thing um, I think it's really useful to work out kind of like what your shtick is with replies um, you know maybe vary it up a little with how you give your first substantive speech I think that plays really well kind of gives you a little bit of like vibe with the judge you know like judges are normally writing their OAs during replies and they'll listen out for like a few good lines if you can hook them in with like whatever makes your reply special that's more credit that you're able to claim for the really good stuff you're doing to package the debate up well um, in terms of what happens when you might be losing the debate uh, and even if you're winning and you want to win by a big margin um, so obviously like your opposition will make mistakes in the same way that you do 
what you want to do is flag those mistakes, uh, point out the instances where arguments are under-mechanized, and use that to undermine the impact that they try to claim. So like, obviously, if a team is unable to prove why they get to point B, they can't claim that the scale of point B is like the most important thing in the debate. This is, I think, really useful because if you are losing a debate so far because you haven't responded, that's not a new response you're giving. You're taking the material that's already in the debate and analyzing it for the judge. So I think that's probably the best way to narrow margins in a reply if you are losing, or even try to flip it, is by explaining, like, even if this material was unresponded to, obviously don't say that, um, why was it under-analyzed when it did come out from the opposition team? Why does that mean that, that impact doesn't matter? And then you bring in your own case and explain why it outweighs that analysis. Uh, basically, like a good reply is able to clean up really messy debates and just tell the judge exactly what material should be credited to what extent. Um, I think my like pro tip for that is to never like admit that a debate is messy because as soon as you do that, everyone has like minus three speaker points, and that's not great if you want to break high or even just like you know get the speaks that you are deserving of. So make sure what you do at reply is explain why the case is really tidy. Uh, all those things, that's really good. Um, what else do I have to say? Oh yeah, amazing. Biggest don'ts. <laughs> These are some things that I do badly that you should not do. So don't speak to four minutes 30. Um, unfortunately, despite uh, my best efforts, that is my reputation as a reply speaker now. Um, people will stop listening after 4.15. They start typing really loudly and you're saying really good lines and no one cares. So uh, time appropriately. Um, I think the other big don't is that like, obviously you give an eight minute substantive speech and that is a speech that you know most intimately out of your bench, but don't just call back to that speech, um, especially well, no, in every speaking style, right? There will always be at least one speech after you. If you're only calling back to your speech, like, obviously that's lazy because you're not listening to your partners, but it's probably also bad for your case because presumably, like, the speaker after you has offered some good new responses the judge has credited, and the case has moved forward. If you keep the case where it was at at first or second, that is a regression from the margin you could be winning from. So make sure, like, Replies are a team sport, right? You want to present the best version of your case. If it's neg block, you want to be listening really carefully and writing that with whoever the other speaker is that's not giving a speech, making sure that they're flagging the new contributions your third speaker is making. Uh, if it's F, you have even more time to make sure you work with your other speakers and ensure that you're able to flag the new additions they make. Um, and even if you are a very selfish debater, that is a very good thing to do because like obviously you help the speakers whose material and contributions you flag, but you also help your own reply because I think the biggest ways that replies often get penalized when people are judging them is because they're like, hold on, you were first F, your reply sounds like first F, there have been six speeches in between. Um, and you want to show that you're actually like listening to the debate and stuff. Um, and then I think my like biggest piece of feedback is like be like a toxic boyfriend and not a liar. So you wanna reshape the debate, but not rewrite it totally gaslight in like subtle ways. Um, if people say that any other speech in a debate is gaslight, uh, they're wrong. It's always replies uh, because the best reply like convinces the judge they didn't see the debate they saw. They see the debate that you give them in four minutes and maybe 25 seconds. <laughs> um, uh, in, terms of, in terms of some like general tips uh, of how I got better replies, um, so like practice heaps, um, don't be like selfish about it, right? Like if you're in a team where people are trying out replies, make sure everyone is getting an opportunity to, but the more replies you give, the better you'll get at trying out those different strategies. So like my first year of speaking as a first speaker, I just did best case, worst case. Obviously that's not how I deliver replies now. That's just the more that you try out, the more that you see, the more comfortable you get with using different techniques. Um, I think practicing judging helps a lot because obviously like the skills that you use in delivering a reply speech are quite similar to the skills that you use to like convince a really good team that they've lost a debate. Um, so the more practice you have at delivering adjudications and balancing different arguments, explaining why one pathway is more believable than another, which is often what you do as a judge, those skills are really useful in terms of trying to be objective, but like, you know, towards your side kind of, uh, and explaining to the judge why you win. Um, reading a lot, and I think like, you know, that can be news, but it can also just be like fiction and stuff, like whatever you enjoy reading. 
Uh, the bigger grasp you have on like vocabulary, kind of the easier it is to explain concepts, especially in messy debates. The more that, the more clarity that you can apply to a debate, the easier it is for a judge to believe that your reply is better than a more technical one, and therefore your case is obviously more believable as well. Um, so, I mean, like, I literally read maybe like nine out of ten books I read are body strippers, but I still think that my vocabulary has improved a lot. So, uh, that's fun. And then I think the last thing is I know people dislike recording themselves. Um, I did a lot when I first started debating, but now I'm very used to the sound of my own voice. Uh, it's a constant companion. <laughs> uh, if you're able to dissect kind of where you are less confident in the replies you give, that obviously helps you figure out the kind of techniques that you need to do the most work on. Um, so record yourself, listen to them, don't be like too critical, everyone's on a learning journey, we all give shit speeches sometimes, and that's fine, but if you're able to kind of listen to it kindly, work out the things you're doing well and improving on, and the things that could use work, I think that's the best way to get better at those speeches. I believe that's my last slide, it is. Any questions? Thank you. Obviously when you're second, you've kind of had a chance to listen to the contributions that first speakers have brought up. So in some ways, you're less likely to drag the debate back to <laughs> the very start uh, as much as like first speakers who are still learning replies are. So I think that's good. Use that to your advantage, right? Like you've probably got a better conception of where the debate is heading. Once you've given your speech, you know the new contributions you've added. Listen out for what changes in those last two or three speeches. Kind of like if the case uh, expands or narrows a bit in terms of focus all of those kinds of things you want to be able to explain to the judge like why it makes sense for your case to narrow for example like if your first speaker claims a really big burden and by the end of the debate you realize that like your third kind of gets up and you're like no the debate is not about like ending global hunger it's about like a very small context you want to be able to explain why those changes happen in terms of like ways to track that, put your first speaker to work. Like if they're done and they're not giving a speech after that, uh, a lot of it is just about like trusting your teammates and you have to kind of practice prepping with them to work on that. Um, but this is like generic advice for any speech is just always have one speaker that's just writing down what's happening in the debate at the moment and tracking new contributions and things like that. That's obviously useful when you're giving a responsive speech, but especially if you've just got that like trusted person um, that is writing down new contributions, anyone can just ask them, like, what's the key thing that we haven't looked at yet? And you're able to use that for both the third and the reply. Yes? spoken third so clashes to me are like a totally foreign concept but I think they're quite similar to pathways in general like you'll have like a few kind of ways the debate could go um, the way that I often end up kind of structuring it will be like kind of what characterization is most believable and why and what does that mean for the rest of the debate and it kind of cascades in a way that clashes would at third sometimes the way that it's framed is a little bit different um, and then the other question was like generosity to the other team. So I always think we're on the side of being like more generous, but in like a condescending way. <laughs> so you know, like if you believe their argument to the full extent, which you know they don't prove it, and we've told you why they don't prove it, but if you do, this is what it looks like. And that's that kind of worst case stuff. Like I always, when I present that analysis, I'm not doing it in a nice way. Like I'm not saying like we have lost and this is what it looks like. I'm like. If you don't believe any of the amazing analysis we gave you and credit their arguments to the full extent, which they don't uh, prove, this is the outcome they get. Why is that still not enough to win the debate? Um, but you never wanna be like mean about it because you don't know how much you're winning by unless you're like really good at knowing if you win debates, but um, I'm still not. So um, <laughs> I think always err on the side of like treating your opponents with respect uh, because that's the way that you're most likely to actually track the arguments you're making, respond to them to the fullest extent, and then actually win the debate by the margin that you're claiming to win the debate by. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> on Gex Biden. Yes. Uh, <laughs> how, much, how much can you assume a good adjudicator is going to believe you if you, like, try to say things <laughs> like, this was totally new and, like... Yeah, so... How much do you read into the person? That mind? is why I say gaslight and don't lie. <laughs> so you can't, you can't say that, like, things are totally new or things are present in your case when they're not but what you can do is kind of like shift the way they see the debate a little bit so what you're trying to say is like it is not a fatal flaw to our case that we didn't explain why this thing happens because obviously this thing would happen for xyz reasons uh and, and then you're not just being like we told you this impact happens and the judge is like i wrote notes on this debate and they obviously did not say that um, so you, you want to kind of like shift the parameters of what the judge can choose to believe without expecting them to have not watched the debate. Um, I, I think the best way to do it is like if you think the judge is like questioning their read on what the clashes actually were <laughs> or like what the relative importance of arguments were, you're probably gaslighting well. If the judge is a little confused and skeptical, um, walk it back a little bit. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, we probably have to go to Club Night now because it was six. Almost six thirty. Thirty minutes. Woo! Like, what a cute reply. Exactly. Oh, yes. Half the length of a normal seminar. First time I've done that. <laughs>